Acción. When you were writing uh, the song, Take a Bow, was there any conception of like Spain or Matador at the time mm -mm. that comes entirely later? No, I was actually thinking of a movie star when I was writing it. And, um, but I thought, when I tell the story of this visually, I wanted it to be about a, a sort of an obsessive love story, a tragic love story that doesn't work out in the end. And if this, if this character, this person that I'm, this, the object of my desire is an actor, how do I show what he does that's going to read to people? Desperately Seeking Susan and I'm Susan. I play a very free-spirited, adventurous femme fatale who basically is irresponsible and spends most of her time living off of other people's good graces and charming everyone and, um, and breaking people's hearts and causing lots of trouble. But everyone likes her because she, she represents fun and adventure. It's directed by Susan Seidelman who did a movie called Smithereens. So it's like a murder mystery comedy romance. Good going, stranger. The uh, girl, girl on girl sex stuff, the lap dancing with the stripper, made some make some viewers uncomfortable. Good. Girls go to strip clubs all the time and get lap dances, you know. But we only see guys doing it. It's not about you know girls. It's not even about lesbians. It's just about women having fun and going out and being naughty and and silly and you know doing things that guys think are only you know their territory. Kind of very um, looking forward to where we're going and seeing how fast we're moving and especially in uh, technologically. Rain, kind of like life in fast forward motion, kind of zooming towards the end of the um, 20th century. Basically, it's just been two days of me dancing like a maniac. I didn't have a date for the Academy Awards in the a comment in itself on our culture. Absolutely. <laughs> and I said, well, and, and Michael's like, well, who are you going to go with? And I said, I looked at him, I said, I don't know, you want to go? And he said, yeah, that'd be great. Afterwards, after the show and everything, did you and Michael go home together or, or, uh -huh. or what happened? Well, no, we went to um, Spago. Yeah. And there was a big party and we stayed there for hours and hours and hours. And, uh, and then, yes, he took me home. <laughs> And um, now what do you want to know? What happened after that? Yeah. I'm not going to tell you. Okay. I was starting to write music for this album and I didn't really know which direction I wanted to go in and I was toying with lots of different ideas and then Mirwes' demo arrived at my record company and I heard that and I'm like, oh my God, that is it. I've been listening to a lot of French underground music and um, funnily enough, I'm, that was what I was really into at the time, so it was weird. It was just kind of a strange, fateful thing that happened that his music showed up. I 
just like to keep working with people who are different, who have different sounds. I want to challenge myself in the studio. Hopefully, in the process, I also make a record that people want to hear. I've been to some cowboy bars in America, and it's like a really big deal, and people show up in their cowboy hats, and they're really tight jeans and they're super serious dancing to country and western music and it's really cool because it's pure and people are really enthusiastic when they go there but it's not like really my style like in terms of music but I like the idea of taking that style of dancing and putting it to my music. We saw it, there's just a tiny bit in the video of you on that fucking Bronco. Yeah. Were you any good at that? Because it's a tiny bit. I thought, oh God, perhaps you bailed out. Uh, no, I had to do, I had to take lessons and practice before we shot that. They had to put cushions all over the floor and then I got on it. And you have to get used to it and your, the, you know, your inner thigh muscles are killing you afterwards because you really have to grip. I mean, I guess it's like horseback riding, which I don't really do, so it was hard for me. Is your su success ever scary? I mean, is the mm -hmm. air thinner up there in the stratosphere? Yes. Because I know that lots of people are paying attention to me and watching my every move, and I think I, I, I feel it more than ever now because I'm doing stadium shows, and I get up on stage and I see 65,000 people all standing there, and all of a sudden I feel like... Knowing that you sold a certain amount of records or so many people have bought in this magazine is much different than seeing them all in one room. And feeling their presence and knowing that they want something, they're there to get something from you. There were scenes of what the papers are inevitably calling Madonna mania at Heathrow Airport last night as the singer arrived for a series of concerts. Is it all you dreamed it would be when you were a little girl? No. How could I dream all of this? It's better. It's just bigger than anything I could ever imagine. Don't cry for me. Argentina. Well, I was very passionate about playing the role because she is an amazing, fascinating, confusing, infuriating, incredible woman. <laughs> One of the reasons I pursued this movie so intensely was because I knew it would give me a chance to prove that I was an actress and a singer. She's extraordinary. She did a fantastic job. And I hope everybody will realize how good she is in it. Don't cry for me, Argentina. The truth is, I never left you. Madonna, every time. <laughs> Making this movie was um, an incredible adventure for me, both artistically and spiritually, and I learned so much. And I will never forget it. You sang with a trillion bands, you quit yeah. and you went out on your own. Were you the least bit scared to do that? Not really. I think I've always had a lot of confidence in myself. We took a holiday, we are. We are a couple of weeks into the new year. What do you hope will happen, not only in 1984, but for the rest of your professional life? What are your dreams? What's left? Mm, to rule the world. <laughs> there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Madonna. When I watch that, I'm like, I'm a little bit shocked by my audacity. I was very uninhibited. I was being provocative, as always. And um, what I, I mean, I would like to think that since I said that, I've been a, a, a source of inspiration and an influence in culture since then. Yeah. Um. But 
was a video which um, I, I shot in Venice. Mary Lambert directed it. She directed my Borderline video. I worked with her again because I thought she was really great. Well, we went to Venice. We had to have a line, so we had a line shipped up from Rome. And the line master was really worried when he saw the crew because he said if anyone had their period, the line would eat them. And everyone was a woman on the whole thing. So I promised him, not a chance. <laughs> I'm an Italian-American and I'm proud of it. Proud of being an American because it is the country I grew up in and a country that believes in freedom of speech and artistic expression. I am aware that the Vatican and certain Catholic communities are accusing my show of being sinful and blasphemous. That they are trying to keep people from seeing it. The Vatican were like hearing about my show and they were all upset about it and they were putting all this propaganda in the newspapers about my show and just how blasphemous it was and, and it was all by people who hadn't seen the show and I was enraged. Basically the statement was about freedom of speech and freedom of expression, artistic expression and, and how important that was in society because um, if you don't have freedom of speech and expression then you're basically living a fascist fascistic life and uh, I mean then really there's no reason to live. I like the connotations of, of a burlesque house. When you call something the girly show, I mean that's I'm sure what is in people's head, you know, it's burlesque. I, I feel like there's a lot of references to a lot of things in the show. Ladies and gentlemen, step right up. The greatest show on earth is about to begin. Old musicals, paintings, you know, art, mm. movies. It's not just like me standing in front of a band kind of doing my record. It's not something that anyone can take out of context because it's just the audience and me and I feel an incredible sense of freedom. Well, this whole video has been inspired by Saturday Night Fever. It's a tribute to John Travolta and that whole area. All that jazz, Bob Fosse, a chorus line, Olivia Newton, John, we love you. Um, John Travolta, you are the man. It's a backbone to the whole thing. We have Madonna in a rehearsal space as she is uh, dancing on her own, practicing her, her moves, so that she can utilize them when she goes, goes out, meets these guys. Physical, physical. The new album is a lot more grown up than the first album. It's a lot more well-rounded um, style-wise. There's some old stuff that sounds like old Motown. There's some really high energy, you know, stuff that maybe sounds more English, more techno. There's a lot of synthesizers. I just, I think it's, it just shows, it shows my growth as a singer and a songwriter. I chose to work with Nile Rodgers because I think that he's a genius and I wanted to work with a genius on my record.
I was uh, paying homage to the Motown thing. I was saying it worked back then. It could easily work now because she's got the image to carry it. Madonna is a movie star, a rock video sensation. And tonight she winds up a 26-city concert tour, which has been completely sold out, largely to teenage girls. I like her attitude. She dares to be different and lets us dare to be different, too. You gotta, when you start a show, you got to come on strong or you're not going to hold them through the rest of the show. you got to have a great beginning and a great middle and the best ending so that they don't forget you when they leave. You would have asked me the week after I fell off my horse and broke ten bones that I could imagine that, you know, eight months from then I would be, you know, as physical as I am, singing and dancing and, you know, being on tour, I would have said, no, no way. I'll be the garden, you'll be the snake, all of my fruit is yours. Madonna's done everything, it's never good enough, it's got to always be better and, you know, you got to push, push it, push the envelope, so. We will never settle, is what it is. She will never settle. This is who I am. You can like it or not. You can love me or leave. Madonna strapped herself to her cross during her performance of the song Live to Tell. It's a lack of respect for all Christians. People came after you. Vatican said very poor taste, meant to be provocative by being blasphemous. Mm -hmm. Others said publicity stunt. I think lines are meant to be crossed. You've gone back to your roots and just made a completely, you know, four to the floor, unapologetic disco album. Yep. Why now? Because I'm in the mood to dance. That's really the plain and simple. And there are no gaps in this record. No gaps. Goes song to song to song to song. No ballads. Put on your dancing shoes. Mirawez recommended Stuart to me um, when I was doing the Drowned World Tour. We started working kind of first in the band sort of situation. Then I started working as musical director and then after the second tour of kind of rearranging songs and remixing songs, it just kind of spilled over into doing a record. The only difference was, instead of remixing old songs, we were coming up with new ideas and then effectively remixing them to make new music. It's fun music, it's fun to perform, and you know, you don't have to take it too seriously. And it's liberating. It's a song about a teenager having a baby. It's called Papa Don't Preach. The song's a big hit, but its lyrics have raised a storm of controversy. I think it encourages teens to be sexually active. I think it encourages teens to get pregnant. I think it encourages teens to have babies when they get pregnant. It's not an anti-abortion song. What it says is there's other choices. And that is, instead of killing your baby, you can keep your baby. Right there, that discourages abortion which could be a problem for America. I don't think that's very good at all, what she's, you know, what she's telling people in her songs. It celebrates life. It celebrates a teenager making um, a difficult decision. You want to have a baby or you get pregnant, you have to think of all the, the expense. Uh, love is not everything. Well, it was more an issue about your parents accepting you, yes. no matter what happens, you know what I mean? And it was about a father choosing to love and support her daughter, even regardless of what she chose to do about you know, keeping the baby. Academy Award show, you seem to, when there was a very tight close-up and you seem to be a little nervous, yes. of course, in front of a house like that, you can understand that. Well, how about how there was a billion people watching? Yeah. 
Ja, hij was nu. I had never performed live with a 50-piece orchestra yeah. before, and that was daunting in itself. And then um, <clears throat> the uh, microphone that I, I sang with was supposed to come sort of telescope out of the ground. And as I was coming out of the, gr the ground, a techie underneath the stage said, your telescope, your, your microphone isn't going up. I'm thinking, great, I'm going to walk forward and there's going to be no microphone, and then what am I going to do? So I thought, well, don't look, don't panic. <laughs> Just look good for the first 30 seconds, and then you can fall apart. When I get a then they be a man. I'm counting to ten. And You know, you, when you do a live performance, you have to sort of get through all the things yeah. that aren't exactly perfect, and it's inevitable that something will go wrong. Yeah. And, 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 and the more experience you have dealing with those things, they are, and so I think I did pretty well. I was the groom, and yeah. I had two brides, yes. right? So, you know, the groom and the bride are supposed to kiss. Everybody comes to Rehearsals, rehearsals we did. It was very, you know, mwah, mwah. Yeah. Right? If, if Brittany looks like she's, you know, kissing me in an aggressive manner, it was a surprise to me. <laughs> but, but it was totally meant in innocence and fun, and I, I, I don't know. I don't know why people are making such a big deal about it. Did you know that it was like on the front page? Of the I had no idea that it was going to cause the uh, the ruckus that it caused. <laughs> I mean, I've it was just a friendly kiss. <laughs> Hasn't anyone ever seen two girls kiss before? You weren't trying oh, please, to make a no. statement or do anything about what? I, I don't know. I don't know. Just I made those statements ten years ago. Ten years ago. <laughs> This is not just provocative costumes and choreography here, because according to one of the video's producers, Sharon Orek, the, the, they made the video to represent the way Madonna spends her life on display sexually without being treated as a real person. Uh, that's why they used the peep show setting, and she's only able to escape her world on stage in the company of the young boy who still has his childhood innocence. It was about innocence versus decadence, really, and in the mm. end, I chose innocence. I mean, that's what the child represented. You know, the childlike quality that everybody has versus all the people in the club who, you know, sort of were jaded and decadent and depraved. It's meant to be provocative, you know, but it's not only meant to be provocative in a sexual way, also in a thinking in, a, in, in other ways, you know. Pretty much what you hear on the album is what the original demo form of each song was. That, that's probably why it has that raw feeling. To it. When I write music, I like to write them like, in my mind, there's a little movie playing, and I always envision scenarios and characters. It's not always something that I've experienced, but I always say it in the first person, so it seems like it's a personal thing. You give me fever. The most important thing is that I feel fulfilled as an artist, and what ultimately what the world gets out of it and what they choose to see. I can't control it or predict it. Of course I always hope that that they will see that and, and get past 
what they consider the scandal. I only have control over what I do as an artist, and, and if I do, if I say what I want to say, then I have fulfilled myself. Fantasies in this clip are of bondage, domination, and submission. Some people have no objection to such role-playing games as long as they're consensual. Others find such practices repellent, which is why MTV is not airing this video in regular daytime or evening rotation. I want to get an insight, if I can, into, into why you made it, when you must have known that quite a few of the recognized broadcasters around the world won't show it. Because that's how I visualize the song. When I close right. my eyes and I think of the song and I think of what's erotic to me, that's what I see. People don't have to like it, but they should be tolerant of it. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it. There are plenty of people who enjoy these things, who see life this way, who are um, sexually or sensually aroused by these things. And people shouldn't be considered bad or shameful for having these thoughts or feelings. It was originally inspired from the, a scene in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, which starred Mar Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. And um, she did a, a song called Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. And so I based it on that, that That's scene in the movie. True Blue, you produce. Well, with Steve Ray yeah. and Pat Leonard. The more I've been in the studio, the more I've learned about the technical side of produ production and the engineering side. I've come from it from a much more instinctual point of view than knowing what buttons to press. And when I hear things, I sing them, you know, to the musicians, to play them, you know, the parts and stuff. And everything is based on feel and the way it sounds to me. I'll have the music and I'll get on the microphone and I'll just start singing. It's like improvisation, you know. While I was on tour, I wrote a few songs. Once I get into the music thing and I'm really playing music every night and stuff, I get more inspired to write. Um, my favorite song is La Isla Bonita. It's a sad song and it just has a, a mood to it that I really like. like I go to the desert and have a mystical experience. Yeah. It's quite beautiful, but I'm all alone. And the day turns into night, and it's me and some birds and a dog. Mm -hmm. And it's very haunting. I think that there's a lot of magical, mystical powers in the desert. I think it's a magical place to be. It is quite haunting at night. Are you supposed to be a character of some sort? I'm a mystical creature in the desert. That's fun, yeah. And I'm the embodiment of female angst. <laughs> you? Yes! <laughs> I had my own ideas about God, and then I had um, the ideas that I thought were imposed on me. I believe in God, I believe that everything you do comes back to you. I think, I believe in the innate goodness of people and the importance of that. 
if you don't express yourself, if you don't say what you want, then you're not going to get it. And in, a, in, a, in effect, you are chained down by your inability to say what you feel or go after what you want. Lots of times Pat Leonard will come up with um, a piece of music and he throws the music at me and I just listen to it over and over again and, and somehow the music suggests words to me and I just, just start writing the words down. I will come to Pat with a, an idea for a song either lyrically or emotionally and say let's do something like this or I'll have a melody line in my head which I will sing to him and he will sort of pound out the chords to. It's a learning experience to deal with my fears, to deal with my past, to deal with my life and express myself through my work. And I mean, let's face it, it's not 100% autobiographical. I draw from things that have happened to me. She's had enough. She says the end. But she'll come back. She knows it then. A chance to start it all again. Till death do us part. People that work out their inner turmoil through mass acceptance and mass acknowledgement, I think that that is the most fascinating thing about her. Everybody seems to know what I'm doing every day in my life anyway, so I might as well, I might as well not be ash ashamed or afraid to approach it in my artwork. Hi, I'm Madonna. I want to conquer the world. <laughs> I don't think that I'm using sex to sell myself. I think that I'm a very sexual person and that comes through in my performing. I don't think of it consciously, well, I'm going to be sexy to get people interested in me. It's the way I am, it's the way I've always been. I'm a very sort of outspoken forward gal. When I die, I don't want people to forget that I existed. It's incredible what I've done. holy grail of entertainment in America, the right. Super Bowl, so it's, there's a lot of pressure. I want those almost one billion people watching to be mm -hmm. properly entertained. The nervousness and the craziness of starting with a blank football field, right? right. And my stage gets built in eight minutes. Just the newness factor and the sh that short window of time that we have to get the show right is, mm -hmm. makes me feel an enormous amount of anxiety. We do a lot of crazy stuff on the stage. Let your body move. I have never worked so hard or been so scrupulous or detail-oriented or freaked out as much as I have maintaining my sanity and trying to make the most amazing show for the Super Bowl. We basically sat down and just threw out every idea we could possibly conceive of, of all the things we wanted, all the imagery we wanted, and I had a few set ideas. I chose the whole Metropolis setting because I, it's really my tribute to that movie. I mean, I love Fritz Lang's movie. And the whole idea of, of men being sort of chained to that, that work ethic. But that, I considered that to be the very masculine, male-dominant world and my world was feminine. The theme of Express Yourself is, <laughs> I can't say it. 
<laughs> it's a very crass. Well, it's very crass, but basically, is that pussy rules the world? Okay, I said it. The cat was a metaphor, you know what I mean? And it, but, but it represented femininity, and I think that there's that side in all men, as well as there's the masculine side in me. That's why eventually I went into that world and I wore a suit and I had a monocle and I behaved as a man. Um, David, David's idea for the cat to like lick the milk and then Which pour it over, great. it's great. And believe me, I, I mean, I have to, um, I fought him on that. I didn't want to do it. I thought, oh, it's just so over the top. and silly and kind of cliche like art art student or film student kind of trick you know but I'm glad that I gave in to him there's always a certain amount of compromise that takes place and a certain amount of sort of being beholden to someone if you are in love with them and it doesn't matter how in control you think you are but it's something that you choose to do. And no one put the chain around my neck I, except me. So <clears throat> I was chained to my desire. TV news in LA, doing what Los Angelines do, sitting on the back of a 1959 pink Cadillac yeah. with Donna Delore from Madonna's <laughs> band. And we've been cruising up and down LA. We're just going to talk a little bit about the VMAs. Now you're performing tonight in the VMAs. Yes, going to be exciting. Yeah, it's going to be really exciting. You're, re fun. you're redoing Vogue. Yes, we're redoing it. Very different. It's a big surprise for everybody. So you guys have to tune in and watch it because it's really hot. I mean, how different? I can't, it's from a whole other place in time, that's all I can say. And I'm gonna be, you know, I'm gonna have a booth and a, and a big do and everything. We're gonna, it's gonna be great. great. It's gonna be a lot of style, a lot of clap. Ah, yes. I'm not gonna even waste your time with the intro. Y'all know the one and only Madonna. Because we did it live on MTV, it changed the way people brought performances to MTV, I believe. It was more grand than most people had done before. So I think it would brought a level of class to those, those award shows. One of my favorite MTV memories of, of watching the VMAs before I was even around was uh, Madonna's take on the performance that she did of Vogue using all those old powdered wigs and, you know, the corsets. Little old Richard. Richard, what did you make of the show tonight? Oh, I loved the show. I loved everything. I loved Madonna because Madonna is so bold and she's daring. She does whatever. It was just so amazing and it was provocative and it was uh, it was definitely pushing the envelope and it was bold and it made quite a statement and especially as a woman, I thought it was really, really amazing. Oh, oh. Coming to you live from Radio City Music Hall on the first annual MTV Video Music Award. MTV, let it rip! Everyone was expecting her to do either Borderline or Lucky Star, which were her two big hits that she had previously just had. And she came out and did a, did a song that nobody had heard before and was rolling around on the stage in, you know, a wedding dress and, and garter belts and just opened up everybody's eyes and it was wow Next to every once in a while I get a reaction from another performer who's a feminist um, a singer and if I do get anything from them I think it's really I think they're just they're, they're jealous and envious of me. I don't think people really knew what to think of her. Um, you know, I could hear all of these comments, you know, like, you know, or all that sort of thing going on. Um, 
I'm not going to tell you what to do with your life and you're not going to tell me what to do with mine. I enjoy this. I'm not, you know, this is my choice. And I'm bringing, I, what I, I think I'm bringing happiness to people. So it's as simple as that. The camera angle on her was not very flattering. And she was kind of rolling around on the ground and it was, I thought to myself, oh God, this is going to, I thought, I had so much, I, I had really high hopes for it, and I thought maybe it would uh, be like a laughing stock or something, I don't know. I was worried that it might uh, derail the, the hit. It was clear to me that I was watching uh, a change in the whole music industry. The book, as you've no doubt heard by now, is a somewhat unwieldy aluminum-bound collection of pictures by fashion photographer Stephen Mizell, depicting Madonna in various states of undress, having fantasy sexual encounters with similarly scantily clad persons of various sexes and races, often in an S&M environment. The most outrageous act of a mainstream star in history. Madonna has put out a sex book and video that some believe are downright obscene. But is it porn or an artist's way of expressing herself? There are those who definitely feel she has gone too far. My problem with her is that she's so eager to shock people that sometimes she can be very irresponsible. A member for parliament here has complained about the book, calling it vile, obscene and pornographic. So the police have now referred it to the Crown Prosecution Service. You're a civilized country. We're supposed to be a civilized country. And we're all going haywire about Madonna. The, the picture of you astride the mirror, mm -hmm. masturbating. Mm -hmm. I thought that was horrible. Why? It, it just strikes me as horrible. I think people, I think that people's reaction to specific situations in the book was much more a reflection of, of, of that person than, than me. The most annoying, alarming, and appalling personality of 1992, Madonna! <laughs> never cease to amaze us. What's next? Department. More genius. We asked hard copy viewers, are you tired of Madonna? Thousands of you called and over 77% said yes, you are tired of her. Let's go kiss a guy in the audience. Why don't you go kiss Why the guy in the audience? Why are you so obsessed with my sex life? As we all know, I have none of my own. Well, I knew that I was going to cross the line by doing it. I mean, I knew I was getting into a very shady area. I knew I was dealing with a lot of taboo subjects, and I knew that it was going to upset a lot of people, but I felt that it needed to be done, so I did it. But minorities needed somebody who's popular that people looked up to, 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 to step forward and say, this is okay. It's okay to feel this way. It's okay to be this way. It's okay to have sexual fantasies. It's okay to be gay. It's okay to be bisexual. It's okay to be all of these things, because when we are constantly told to be ashamed of our feelings then then everyone's living a lie and this and this feeling manifests itself in very unhealthy ways it was an act of rage on my part in the beginning everyone agreed that i was sexy but no one agreed that i had any talent and that really irritated me and the sex book was sort of like the pinnacle of me challenging people and i was turning my nose up at the whole idea that you know women aren't allowed to be sexual and erotic and provocative and intelligent and thoughtful at the same time. Absolutely no regret. She doesn't want to live off camera, much less that's talk. It, that's it. Why would you say something if it's off camera? And tomorrow, you're going what, to be so what point is there of existing? If we can't get it to sound better than this, then I'm not doing a show. <clears throat> I'm waiting. I take a pull. Yeah, and ram it up your ass. I'm just kidding. We're all on separate frequencies, so there's so Put me on their fucking frequency, and you, you know, I mean, you know.
everybody has a preconceived notion of what I am. And since they're all sort of preoccupied about what I'm doing behind the scenes, you know, I'll just give them something that they can really sink their teeth into. Somebody stuck some big fat man up in the front to give me dirty looks all night long. I swear to God. Do something else. Do my eyebrows. She's a down line. Did she say she thinks me? No. I remember looking at her bush. And she went to the bathroom and her butt was bleeding. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm Anybody who says my show is right. neat well, has well, to well, go. Well. You come across sometimes as a little crude, mm -hmm. demanding, temperamental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why were you willing to show that side of yourself to people? Why do that? Because that side of myself exists. Like a Did you guys hear what? that the police are here? Why? If I touch my crotch during the show, I'm going to be arrested. Are you what? serious? What? All you have to do is go out there and tell them I am not changing my show. I am an artist, and this is how I choose to express myself. Dad, I'm not getting racy. I've been racy. I know. Can you tone it down a bit? What, for you? Yeah. No, because that would be compromising my artistic integrity. Of course. I think two men kissing will probably gross a lot of people out. Oh, yeah, I get it done. I'm happy to be the instigator of that gross out. Oh, my God. I'm getting a hard on it, okay? <laughs> Dare. Dare. What? Dare. Show us with that bottle how you give head. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> everyone pressured me to leave just about everything out. In fact, everyone pressured me just to forget the whole thing. <laughs> just buy that movie back, put it in a closet, and have someone release it when you're dead. It's just sort of. It's, and I say it in the movie, it's to explode the myth of that, that people that we raise up on a pedestal, people that we turn into icons, mm -hmm. people that, you know, we, we make them inhuman. And so they're not allowed to have, they're not allowed to fail, they're not allowed to make mistakes, they're not that allowed to... flaws? Exactly. And so what I'm saying is, look, these things exist. Yes, I am a tramp. <laughs> and I'm proud of it. Shot in Paris by director Jean-Baptiste Mondino, the clip from Madonna's new single, Justify My Love, was due to receive its world premiere on MTV this weekend. But on Monday, when MTV programming executives got their first look at the video's steamy bed scenes, gay and lesbian snuggling, S&M clothes scents, and briefly bared female breasts, they decided they couldn't air it. Instantly, a storm of questions arose. Is this a kind of censorship? Has Madonna finally gone too far? We didn't really even have a chance to try to make it viewable they didn't they rejected it completely and so then i had to think you know with my manager you know what next what should we do and we decided hell you know let's let's sell it let's sell it like a video single it's never been done before and you know the controversy just happened it wasn't planned but you know but in the end you're gonna wind up making even more money than you would have yeah so lucky me <laughs> had you know, gay things going on and freaky things going on and it was amazing though. what I think that sexuality is something that Americans would really rather just sweep up under the rug. And I think that if my video provokes an open discussion, you know, maybe the kids will go and ask their parents these questions, you know. If it provo provokes an open discussion about sex with their parents, I think this is a really good thing. To justify. The people at MTV come to you and said, we hope your next video will be a little more arable? Or... No, no, I don't think so. I'm sure they're They're not that, that foolish. <laughs> to justify I love a lot of sort of techno music, but the thing about techno music is that you never think of it as being very emotional. So what I wanted to do was make it intimate, make it emotional, like sort of prove that it could be. And I was really looking forward to finally going into the studio and writing music that was 
my point of view, from my heart. It's almost psychedelic, dare I say. Yeah, drug music without drugs. Yeah, is that possible? Well, I guess it None is. None of us are on anything. It's possible if you have really free people, yeah. because ultimately that's what drugs do. They free your mind and give you the feeling like you have, you know, yeah. no inhibitions. The face of you, my substitute for love. It's been really fun. I've never had so much fun really working yeah. on it. Never felt so free to experiment. I was interested in kind of fusing a kind of futuristic sound, but also using. Um, lots of kind of Indian and Moroccan influences and things like that. And I wanted it to sound old and new at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I thought that William Orbit's music pretty much embodied that feeling. And since I loved his remixes of mine so much, I decided just, you know, instead of giving him my song sure. later when I'm done, why don't I just make the whole record with him? This is definitely a very full-on production for Madonna as well. I think it's important to mention that. And I'm learning a lot of production techniques off of you, which I hadn't figured I was going to do coming into this project. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, more ah. in, I'm more instinctual. Ray of light, Madonna. This is such a surprise and I'm so honored. Nothing really matters. Love is all we need. Everything I give. I've come a long way. I used to think I was in touch with my inner self and then I realized that was my inner ego. I feel like when my daughter was born, I was born again. Uh -huh. And uh, I look at life with a new set of eyes. Little star. I think this record was, is really kind of like the result of finally coming to terms with who I am and learning to love myself. Now Madonna is relaunching herself and she's using a television commercial for a soft drink to do it. Pepsi um, signed up Madonna for something like $5 million to endorse Pepsi and to make a Pepsi commercial. But at the same time, Madonna releases her video for Like a Prayer. And this appears on TV virtually simultaneously with the Pepsi commercial. Well, people went nuts. Certain pressure groups threatened Pepsi with a boycott. Well, with the competition between Pepsi and Coke so fierce, Pepsi instantly backed down and took the commercial off the air. Before we made the video, there was a meeting with several record company executives who said point blank they would like to come up with another idea and, and do something else. And Madonna said point blank, F you, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want um, and music television will play it. After that, they pretty much left us alone because Madonna had staked out her territory that she was going to do this. People who are really, if they're really passionate and they really are, have an open mind and they really watch closely, I think that the video has a very positive message. She saw a crime being committed against a woman by some thugs and then she saw the police come and arrest the black character, black man, instead of the real guys who did it. And she saw this all. So what does she do now? Does she keep quiet or does she go to the police? But what does she do? She goes to church for guidance and she prays there. And in her experience of her prayer, there's the saint comes to life in her dream. And at the end of it, she winds up making the right decision and going to the police and getting and getting um, 
innocent man out? It was about um, overcoming racism and overcoming the fear of, of, of telling the truth, of getting, you know, so many people witness crimes in there. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to get involved Absolutely. because it will only bring them trouble. They're afraid to stand out on a limb and stand up for someone else. It may go down as one of the most expensive advertising blunders ever. It was just amazing to get um, the, the level of reaction was kind of overwhelming. So I thought it would be the lead off story in like the calendar section or the you know, entertainment section. I didn't know it'd be the lead off story at five on every news station. I think that they were afraid of the controversy that the video was gonna cause. How did they put it to you? I mean, they just, did they say, well, we don't like black guys doing this and with white girls or was there anything like that? Or no, they would never be so honest. Hmm. <laughs> they just said they didn't like it. And uh, a couple of people were threatening to um, boycott the bottling companies in the yeah. south yeah, and kind of wild and then, you know, well i think they were really afraid that this whole thing was going to like blow up and they didn't want to do anything to harm pepsi yeah. which is a sort of all-american symbol yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it dealt with a lot of taboos and um and it made people afraid and i think the people who reacted negatively to it were afraid of their own feelings that they have about those issues it's pretty amazing and powerful that the piece that got pulled was the one that was backed by the big corporation that sells soft drinks and that the music video got to stay on the air. Let's go ahead. Make a wish. And I'd like to thank Pepsi for causing so much controversy. Thank you very much. I think controversy makes people think. The video um, stands up so well today. Um, <laughs> you know, as opposed to, you know, showing by how things are in today's world. I'm not really interested in a rock concert. I don't like that word. I'm interested in presenting more theaters so that there's a catharsis, there's an arc, there's an emotional arc, there's a journey that you go through, you feel. And I present myself in one way at the beginning of the show, and by the time I get to the end, it's something different. I just want to know what thing. Do you believe in love? Cause I got something to say about it. Don't go for a second best, baby. Put your love to the test. I mean, I think that it is a more, much more of a theater piece. No. And, and in that respect, um, I mean, I had to pay a lot more attention to detail and set and costume and lighting no. and stuff, and it just took a lot out of me. There are four different segments of the show, and I change, I sort of change character in each one. I never really come out of character, and it's very, I just stay very focused, very concentrated, there's a lot of movement. I really put a lot of myself into it. I think it's a real personal statement and it's it's much more theatrical than anything I've ever done. My show is not a conventional rock show, but a theatrical presentation of my music. And like theater, it asks questions, provokes thoughts, and takes you on an emotional journey portraying good and bad, light and dark, joy and sorrow, redemption and salvation. I know the moral majority is up in arms against me, but I think that I'm offending um, certain groups, but I mean, I, I think that people who really understand what I'm doing are offended by it, because, because it's pro-life. I'm not interested in hitting people over the head, I think that 
to me, it's more interesting if you interject humor. My boy, I will always cherish you. Give me faith, give me joy, my boy. I mean, there's irony in everything that I do, so. Yeah. In the show. Keep, keep it together, keep it together forever and ever. Keep, keep it together, keep it together forever and ever. I see happiness, I see sadness, I see sour, sorrow, I see joy. I see, you know, religious passion, and I see overt sexuality. I see, you know, all these different things, and I, I was describing life. I wasn't saying you should live your life this way. I was presenting my point of view. I just, I guess I finally got the, uh, the nerve and the artistic inspiration to do what I'm doing now. What is voguing all about? Lots of people wonder if they don't live in New York, where it started many, many years ago. Tell me about this voguing craze. How did it, how did it start? It started around 30 years ago. It was really underground, and um, it started up in Harlem in the gay balls, where, you know, black and Hispanic um, gay men and, you know, transsexuals formed this dance so they, they could um, act like, you know, fashion models and be like, better than everybody else. Strike a pose. I think it's very creative. That whole thing is just too tacky. Like a real good vulgar like gives like attitude, you know. Well, it's an expression. I think it has a lot of humor to it too. I mean, yeah. it's just so sort of arrogant and there and presentational, you know what I mean? Yeah. Self-conscious in a way. And I think it's hilarious. <laughs> I really do. The song Vogue was inspired by walking into a, um, a nightclub. It may have been the Paradise Garage, I'm not sure, but uh, and seeing um, the extravaganza um, uh, crew basically uh, voguing, and I was like, whoa, what the hell is that? And, and it was just the most amazing thing. I knew her, her hairstylist at the time, who's an actress now, Debbie Mazar, and me and her were friends in the club scene, and she told me, uh, Madonna's gonna be looking for dancers, and I never believed her for some reason. And then one night, Madonna was there and she brought me to her. She was like, this is the guy I was telling you about. And I'm like, uh, uh. And I auditioned for her right there on the spot. She said, I heard you do this Vogue thing and I, I want to see. Once the club got winded that she was there, the whole club turned into like an audition, you know? We like your new video. Thank you. It's a very nice video. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, my mother is a big fan of yours. She saw your video and she called me and she said, what does she mean, gives good face? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, it's not exactly like giving good <laughs> It's kind of like, you know, I mean, Rita Hayworth always looked fabulous, right? Yes. Her face was always sitting. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Okay. She gave good face. She never looked rotten. I think it'd be great if everybody was doing it. I think it'd be great. I mean, Vogue, Vogue was going to be a big thing. It was, but it didn't make it, so maybe it will have another chance. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it didn't? Because they didn't have a spokesperson like me. <laughs> <laughs> and why are you promoting it, then? Because I love it. You guys were the pioneers of, of uh, you, Jose, especially, were a real pioneer <laughs> of Vogue dancing. Yeah. Did you ever feel that you and other gay men of color were being used? 
I don't look at it as like she took from the community and people say she never gave back and that, you know, she stole the dance. When in, in reality, I, I feel that she took two of their own, of the community, you know, and like forefront. gave Honored them this you. opportunity Honored, yes. and brought us to the forefront Kept of the integrity forefront. of it. Exactly. You know, so I think that was her way of giving back to the community because yeah. she took two of their own. She elevated because it. And aside from that, I think that it would take a star like her to, to pull to, it out of the community out. and m take it worldwide. I mean, who else can would would have been able to do that? I don't think Vogue would be what it is without her. Madonna really wants people to question themselves, question their society, question life, question where they're in denial of just the way things are. And the fact that she chose such a diverse group of dancers from all different backgrounds and all different races and different sexualities. Like she wanted, she was a, a, a vanguard of diversity. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay.